heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the glory. And the glory. And the power. And the power. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Mercy endures forever. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of the truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thy love is righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath appointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. I have read Psalm 45, verses 1 through 7. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everybody tuning in on the internet and on the phone as we get into another Sabbath day lesson. As always, a few of us was here last night, and uh, we're, getting, we're getting bigger and bigger turnout on Friday night. I guess partly, partly, we got a lot of food coming in now. But no, we, we, we have a, a little steady crowd. But the lesson last night, since we just finished the feast, was after the feast, the real work begins. And that just shows that, hey, it don't take a whole lot of effort to party and enjoy and celebrate. But what the feast stands for is, is really what you got to be about all year long. And, and we pointed out some things, how when Israel left Egypt, they uh, were happy. They celebrated the Passover and um, went on ahead and did with unleavened bread. The Lord destroyed Pharaoh's army. First, he killed the firstborn on the Passover. So they had a great deliverance knowing that none of theirs got, got killed. But as it went, the further they went, they still had to start to follow the Lord's instructions. And they found problems with that. That's why shortly thereafter, even after going through the Red Sea and seeing Pharaoh's army get drowned and, and singing and dancing about that, the next thing you know, they was crying and said, oh, we can't do nothing. We can't conquer these other people. So they still had their work cut out for them after all of that. They should have had enough faith to continue and do what they need to do. But that's not always the case. So that's what we have to remember. So that was last night after the feast. The real work begins. But today we're going to deal with a lesson because last Sabbath it was um, we were dealing with in the middle of the feast and we, we dealt with a lesson about Jesus being the lamb to the lion. So that shows you kind of two facets of Jesus. And this lesson is kind of similar because Jesus wear many hats. He came to die as a Passover lamb, but he's going to come to kill as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as the Passover lamb, he offered himself up, which is how and when he became a, the high priest. And the Bible lets you know that. So, and when he come back and conquer the world, he's going to be king over the world. So Jesus is showing you multiple ways how he uh, wear multiple hats. So he's not just a priest, 
that died for you. A lot of people heard of that part of Jesus. Jesus died for our sins. He died for our sins. But he's not just that. He's a king that's going to rule over everybody. So he died to maintain him some subjects so he can rule over because he's he was set to be born king of Israel. That's what it said in Matthew 2 when the wise men came looking. They came looking for him that is born king of Israel. So we're going to look at it. But the, the whole key to all of it is God been showing you his plan from the beginning. He's been showing his plan, what he's doing. He's just not started in the new days, in the New Testament. His plan go way back, all the way back to Genesis. Even when we dealt with the Passover, we saw that the Passover was slain from the foundation of the world. So this plan been in motion a long time. So that's the title. Jesus, the king, priest, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the individual that showed up. People have an issue understanding who he is, but when you know how God's plan worked, you know who he is. Jesus, the king, priest, Melchizedek, uh, Matthew 26. We're going to start off where we, you know, was dealing with the Passover and show you that that in itself was nothing new. Because when we celebrate the Passover, we had bread and wine in honor of Jesus. Now, all, all the years when they were doing the Passover, that was not a focal point of that ceremony or that service. But Jesus made it a focal point, but it wasn't nothing new. Matthew 26, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Jesus, the king priest Melchizedek. And again, this show you that God's plan, that God's initiative, it's been going forth a long time. Jesus didn't just come and drop out the sky and decide to die and be a priest. He didn't just decide to be a king then. All that was set in motion from day one. Okay, Matthew 26 and verse 1. Go ahead, my brother. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Okay, so now, uh, I like that other mic, mic better. But anyway, he said, uh, yeah, I'm just going to use this other one for the day. Testing one, two. So look, it said, Jesus instructed in advance. He said, in a couple of days, the Passover is coming. I'm going to be crucified. So he knew this all along. He knew in advance what had to take place. So he given forewarning. Knowing who he is, this this in itself lets you know this thing been playing. He know exactly what he got to do. He telling them a couple of days in advance. This is what this all been about. In a couple of days, the Passover is gonna come, and I am going to be uh, betrayed and crucified. And then simultaneously, these religious leaders are plotting to try to kill him. So it's all going on. That's why verse 3 said, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and elders of the people and to the palace uh, of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, to consult that they might take Jesus by subtly and kill him. See, so they making plans to do what got to be done. What they don't know is that they not even going to get no resistance from Jesus because he know he's that lamb. He know he got to do this. They thinking it's going to be real difficult. They don't know that Jesus is waiting on it. That shows you how God's plan. But skip to verse 26 because he told them that's going to happen in a couple of days. Then a couple of days got there and he was celebrating the Passover, not the Lord's Supper, Last Supper, with his disciples. And he did something. Go ahead, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it uh -huh. and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Go ahead. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Uh-huh. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Okay, so now this is when he brought forth what's known as the bread and the wine. As they were eating the Passover meal, 
He brought forth some bread and said, look, do this in, in, in honor of me. He said, take, eat, this is my body. So the bread, like we just celebrated, represented his body. He, he took the cup, which is a cup of wine, and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this, represent, this is my blood, which means represent the blood of the New Testament. See, that's why way back in Zechariah talk about the blood of the covenant. This is the covenant that the Lord, the new covenant that he's establishing with Israel, which is through this sacrifice by this priest, which is Jesus. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Okay, so he let it be known. It's going to be done officially again, but this was his last time. But now, go all the way back to Genesis. Let's show you that this sacrament, so to speak, this representation coming from a priest didn't start right there. God's plan is not new. Genesis 14 and verse 17. Genesis 14 and verse 17. Genesis 14 and verse 17. Okay, go ahead. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Okay, so this is Abraham. Abraham is is went on a mission really to save his nephew, Lot, because him and Lot had went separate ways, and Lot had ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. Eventually, Sodom and Gomorrah ended up in a battle with some kings and got beat down. So they took Lot, Abraham's nephew, captive. So Abraham went on a mission to recover Lot, and, and he did so. And when he got back, of course, the king of Sodom was glad because that's who they had ripped off, these other kings. So when Abraham, that's talking about Abraham, when he got back, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chalatomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Now, this king Sodom, king of Sodom came out. But now we're going to get somebody else, which is where the title come from. Go ahead, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Brought forth bread and wine. Uh huh. And he was the priest of the Most High God. See, now way back here, we got an individual that kind of show up out of nowhere. It said Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So, this is a real unique individual when you pay attention to it, because it's not every day you run into an individual that's walking around known as, it said, King of Salem. So first of all, it said he's a king, right? Mm -hmm. King of Salem. And then it turned around and said, priest of the Most High God. So it's not every day you run into somebody that's walking around saying, I'm a king and a priest. I'm a king and a priest. Even throughout Israel's history, they had kings on one side of the aisle, and they had priests on the other side of the aisle. They had separate. Some were priests and some were kings. But here, this is a unique individual being that he's walking around. He said he's king of Salem and priest of the most high God. And But what did he use for his ministry? What did he use to present to Abraham? What did he bring forth? It said he brought forth bread and wine. See, that's even, that's even unique. If he a king, he, he, maybe he should have had a whole bunch of lambs and calves and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. See, this is, this is all unique. But when Jesus come and get a disciple's bread and wine, that wasn't the first time. Because what people don't know, this was Jesus way back here before he became a man. This was Jesus. And people tried to put their finger on this Melchizedek. They tried to say, well, he was a king come from somewhere else. He just wasn't around. He came from a far country. 
and uh, and they try to identify them. They try to say different things. Some of the footnotes even say things in the Bible to describe him because they really at a loss to identify him. They come up with different conclusions. Even lately, even some brothers I know start saying that really this was Shem, Noah's son. This is this is this is this is lately here. People been saying that. Mm. They say this is Shem, Noah's son. But they just trying to figure out something because it it is when you have to really have some understanding of God's plan and his priesthood and kingship to really understand how this is Jesus because there's really not a whole lot of scripture saying, okay, bam, this is Jesus. It's not a whole lot of scripture, but we know it's Jesus because it can't be nobody else. One thing, it's only one priest of the Most High God. It's only one priest of the Most High God. There's not a couple running around here that we need to be concerned with. So that's the first thing off the bat. And then who is so special enough to come out of nowhere and show up and start talking to Abraham and deal with Abraham and bless Abraham? You know, of the whole Old Testament, to get the ball rolling with God's uh, program, with his people, Israel, his covenant, it all started with Abraham. I mean, Abraham is the central figure back here. Abraham is the central figure. But now all of a sudden this Melchizedek, we going to see he come out of nowhere as, a, as somebody that's technically over Abraham. So that lets you know this is not just anybody. People try to say, oh, that's a Gentile king. You know, Gentiles try to get in there some kind of way sometime. That, see, that was a Gentile king. And notice what it said. He even gave him a city that he was king over, right? Read it again, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Oh, he was king of Salem. And there was no city known by Salem, per se, at this time. But what is Salem? Salem is another name for Jerusalem. That's what Jerusalem is. It's Jerusalem. It's, it mean, Jerusalem means city of peace. That's what it means. So this was just pointing you to Jerusalem. That's all it was. It said he's king of Salem, but all this means something. He brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. What else he do? 19. And he blessed him mm -hmm. and said, blessed be Abraham, Abram of the Most High God, uh -huh. possessor of heaven and earth. So he blessed Abraham. So he was good enough to even bless Abraham. And he blessed Abraham from the Most High God. That's what he said here. It said he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. So now he's indeed showing himself to be a priest because he said, look, I'm representing somebody else, Abraham. I'm, I'm blessing you. You blessed of the most high God, somebody even above me. See, what well, God, see, if you understand this right here, brother and sister, you won't have a problem like some Hebrews do understanding where Jesus fit in at. See, Jesus been in the program. He been showing you this. People think, you know, Jesus just is, was concocted. Some Hebrew, some Old Testament Hebrew, they think Jesus was ju just concocted in the New Testament. And, you know, oh, they just want to say, oh, no, ain't nobody but one. It's just Jah. It's just Jah. You know, it's just Jah. Where well, they don't know, or they say Yah. But they don't know that Jesus, he was the one back here. See, you got two of them back here now. You got one of them blessing Abraham on behalf of the Most High God. But go ahead, verse 20. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Mm -hmm. And he gave him tithes of all. Okay, so now he, he blessed Abraham, and he praised the Most High. He said, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, meaning Abraham in this case, gave him, meaning Melchizedek, tithes of all. So Abraham, after this guy come out with this bread and this wine, 
Abraham evidently respected him and understood that, hey, I got to pay this guy some homage right here. This is somebody right here. Now, who is that special that Abraham is going to pay some homage to? Who is that special that Abraham is going to pay some homage to? But we're going to get some understanding of this. So he, it said he gave him tithes of all, meaning Abraham gave uh, Melchizedek tithes of all that he had got from his excursion with the, against these kings. Let's go to Hebrews 7, to the New Testament, and let the Bible start explaining them. So we already saying the title is Jesus, the king, priest, Melchizedek. That was Jesus there because Jesus didn't just become a man. He existed prior to becoming a man. And he was the one in the Old Testament handling the business for God all along. He's always been the one dealing with uh, mankind, dealing with Israel. So that was him dealing with Abraham. And he lets you know he wasn't by himself. He blessed Abraham of the Most High God. But now, Hebrews 7 and 1. Go ahead. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Okay, so we're reading about the same thing, so we're going to get some understanding of it. We're going to identify. And we're going to find out. Like I said, lately I, I, I had a long conversation with some brothers saying, no, nah, man, that was Shem. You know, see, they just didn't know. You know, everything, Shem was kind of so old, they just start, that's why they, he was, they was that Melchizedek. But when I come over and read this, it don't fit. And they got to kind of twist this to make this work some kind of way. So this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, say, who met Abraham, returning from what? From the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Uh-huh. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So Abraham gave him tithes. That's what tithes is. Tithes is a tenth. Abraham gave him tithes of all. Because Abraham had had, by him going against Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who took off Sodom and Gomorrah, he ended up capturing a lot of stuff. But he gave a tenth to this Melchizedek who met him and blessed him. So it said, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First what, though? First being by interpretation, king of righteousness. Now, first, when you start to understand who this guy is, Melchizedek, first being by interpretation, it said king of righteousness. Go ahead. And after that also, king of Salem, uh -huh. which is king of peace. Well, this is some kind of individual here. After that also, king of Salem, which we read that, which is king of peace. That's why Jerusalem means city of peace. But it's calling this guy some heavy stuff right here. Go ahead. Without father. Okay, now it's gonna get it's gonna start to identify his pedigree, which it don't it don't look like much. It said also to identify Melchizedek, he's he's by interpretation king of rights, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father. Now, if you tell me he is, is Shem and Noah was Shem's father, how does that fit? That didn't make no sense when they told me that. They said, well, you know, that's because I could almost see you trying to stretch that if Noah had died on the other side of the flood and he had kind of lost his father, you know, and Shem was the first one on the flood. You say, well, you know, he had a father, but see, he didn't make it across the flood. But Noah came across the flood. So he, he had his father all the time. How you going to ever say Shem was without father? You can't use that. So it said, without father, what else? Without mother. Without mother, go ahead. Without descent. Without descent. This is not a normal individual, in other words. This was an immortal being. See, and Jesus was the word before he became a flesh and blood man. He was God, without father, without mother, without descent. Go ahead. Having neither beginning of days. Having neither beginning of days. Go ahead. Nor end of life. Nor end of life. Go ahead. But made like unto the Son of God. Uh-huh. Abideth the priest continually. But made like unto the Son of God. See, there was no such thing as, a, as the Son of God. So we looking at a type of the Son of God before the Son of God came. We looking at Jesus before he came. That's all. This is what is letting you know. 
So when Jesus show up and do all that he do, no coincidence that he even used the same ministry tools to represent, to celebrate bread and wine. When he show up and do that, you would know who it is because you already had a prototype of him way back who met Abraham. God's plan is not new. And this guy is not a flesh and blood individual because he don't have a mother, he don't have a father, he didn't have a bloodline that you could trace. That's why these Bibles have a problem trying to identify him. They come up with all kinds of stuff. Well, he came from a far country. Yeah, he came from a far country, okay? He came from heaven. But go ahead, verse 4. Now consider how great this man was. Now consider, see, this all this conversation is about Melchizedek. And throughout the whole Old Testament, you really don't find nobody greater than Abraham. But in comparison, hey, this man greater than Abraham. He met Abraham, and it's, it's making clear a clear distinction who on the top row between them two. Now consider how great this man was. Whom what? Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoil. Unto whom he, it said, even Abraham paid homage to this guy, gave him tithes. Go ahead. And verily they are, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Mm -hmm. That is, of their brethren, mm -hmm. though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Go ahead. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham mm -hmm. and blessed him that had the promises. Okay, so now he gave, he gave you a quick comparison how to show you the significance in that Abraham paid this guy tithes because later on, some of Abraham's descendants started receiving tithes, which was Levi, because Levi became the Lord's priest tribe. But what this is all showing us is that there was a higher priesthood already intact before Levi's priesthood. This is what this is showing you. So it said, Abraham paid this guy the tenth part of the spoils. See, that show you, people say, well, you, you, you should only pay tithes because when the Lord gave the tithes to Levi, you know, it was fruits of the field and cattle and stuff. People say, well, maybe you don't need to pay tithes on money because it's, it never was that. Look, it's whatever you got. Because Abraham, he got spoils from these kings, and he gave a tenth of the stuff that he got here, of all that he got. But it said, verily, they that are, at verse 5, they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood. That's later on. Doing down to Moses' time, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, talking about Melchizedek, because he didn't have no descent, he wasn't a Levite, he received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. So, what's the point here? Verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So without all contradiction, since he blessed Abraham, Abraham is, was less than him. Abraham was less than Melchizedek. So again, it's letting you know this guy, how great this individual was. This was just no ordinary king and priest. Again, you're not walking into, running into somebody that's a king and priest every day. Go ahead, verse 8. And here men that die receiveth tithes. Mm-hmm. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. See, and this is one of the keys to knowing that Jesus is Melchizedek because it said, and here men that die receive tithes. So the Levites started receiving tithes, but they die. But there it said, dealing with Abraham, he got some tithes from Abraham. He receiveth tithes of whom it is witness that he liveth. And that's one of the keys because if he don't have beginning of days or end of life, he got to still be living. He is still here. So the question has to be asked, where is Melchizedek then? Mm -hmm. And if Jesus all of a sudden come in the picture and is a great priest of God, which one is the real one? if they wasn't the same, which one would be the real one? Because we only need one. 
The Bible make that clear. The Bible says it's only one, and that's all it's ever been. See, the Lord just showed it to you before Jesus came and became a man and dealt with it. The Lord just showed it to you way back then. So he been had this plan. It's been set up from day one. Because uh, Melchizedek's still living, and Jesus not going to never die. So we got two of them trying to make offerings for us now, and we don't need that. But, it, but they one in the same. Melchizedek was just Jesus before he became a man. That's all. But go ahead, verse 9. And as I may say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. How did he do that? Go ahead. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. See, it, so it's letting you know that the Levites, which became Israel's priesthood, that that was a lesser priesthood than the one that Abraham paid tithes into. Because Levi come out of Abraham, he started collecting tithes and being the priest over the, for the people. But he, in a sense, he paid tithes since he come out of Abraham. He know better than Abraham. And Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. So the one that ended up receiving tithes had already paid tithes. Go ahead. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, uh -huh. what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek mm -hmm. and not be called after the order of Aaron? See, and that's what Jesus came. Jesus became, we're going to see, he was foretold to be a priest after this order, not after Aaron or Levi. That's why he didn't even bother to be born in the tribe of Levi. That was unnecessary for Jesus. He wasn't coming to, to play that part of a priest. Mm -hmm. That priesthood was just a, a minute version of the one that he came to be a part of. But go ahead, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, mm -hmm. there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Why? Well, the change in the law is that the high priest had to come from Levi. That was it. The high priest had to come from Levi. But the Lord already had a higher priesthood already in four. See, that's why he showed you Melchizedek before Levi was even in existence. So basically, he just said, look, I'm going to take my priesthood and let Levi use it for a little while. Or they're or they going to be a prototype of my priesthood. But in the end, I'm going to be the high priest. But go ahead. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So here who these things are spoken. We're talking about Jesus. Because he's the one that became our priest. And when did he become our priest? When he, he offered himself on the Passover and he resurrected. Now he had made an offering and he's interceding on our behalf. So he became a priest, but he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. But he went back to an older order, a greater order. And that's what we saw in Genesis 14. And that's why he even used this exact same thing that he used when he met Abraham. He gave him bread and wine, didn't he? And when he got with his disciples, when he was about to be the priest, what did he give him? Bread and wine. And that's what we're doing every year. But that was something he showed Abraham, didn't he? But go ahead. What verse you have? 14? 14. Mm-hmm. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, mm -hmm. of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. See, it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. See, it's that, see that's how it have to go. When you got to fulfill many hats, hey, you got to do it according to different aspects. So he came out of Judah, not because he that had anything to do with the priesthood. He came out of Judah because he got to be the king, and the king had to come out of Judah. And he didn't have to come out of Levi to be a priest because he ain't coming after the priesthood of Levi. He coming after a greater priesthood, the one that's established by Melchizedek. That's why the title is Jesus, the king priest Melchizedek. That is him. You don't see a guy that's a king and a priest every day. But now skip to verse 21 and go ahead. For those, for those priests were made without an oath. See, he's talking about Levi. See, he, he really, he, he really going to show you the... Uh, how Levi was secondary to Melchizedek priesthood. Levi was good, and the Lord's still going to use the Levites in the kingdom. But they're going to be under the real priesthood, which is the, after the order of Melchizedek. 
But he's showing you how secondary, how it was just a temporary fix. Even the offerings they made, they made animal sacrifices. That wasn't getting us from under our sins. That was teaching us about the real priesthood that got us from under our sins. See, the priesthood that got us from under our sin is the one after the order of Melchizedek. Not Levi. Levi showed us about it. Levi was as good as for the, what it's worth. But it's secondary to this. So he said, for those priests, talking about Aaron on down, Aaron and his sons had to be Aaron's descendants, by the way, to be high priests. For those priests were made without an oath. In other words, none of them had an oath said, you're going you gonna to be my priest forever. Go ahead. But this with an oath mm -hmm. by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Uh -huh. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this one, Jesus had an oath. Because the Lord swore and wouldn't repent. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. Go ahead. By so, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. A better testament or covenant. Go ahead. And they truly were many priests mm -hmm. because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. See, that's why it was many priests. See, if one priest could have lived forever, if Aaron could have lived forever, he would have been high priest forever. Mm -hmm. See, that's how Rome, the Pope, had a priesthood set out for, after Levi. So even though they don't do it right, you know, they vote him in office and all that kind of stuff. But still, they, 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 they usually make it where they had to die out of office. This one did some tricky stuff recently. He retired. But usually, I mean, they make it where they had to die out of office. They have to die. And as long as they don't die, they usually still priests. Just like John Paul II, he was being propped up for a long time because he was still alive. They were sitting him up. He was asleep half the time. <laughs> but he was still priest until he died. And then when he died, they had another vote. So, because they set, they patterned theirs after Levi. And so... Aaron was the first one. If he could have lived forever, it never would have been another one because you got it for life. So that's what it's letting us know. Uh, verse 23 said, and they truly were many priests. Why? Because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They kept dying. Oh, we got to get another one. He died. Then we go get another one. And so forth and so on. But see, this is the greatness of this priesthood. Go ahead. But this man, mm -hmm. because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. But this man, talking about Jesus, he continue ever have an unchangeable priesthood. But we started off talking about Melchizedek. But it's showing you that Jesus is that one. He picked it up when he died and resurrected, and he picking up this order. And he going to be priest forever. And that's what Melchizedek showed you. Go ahead. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God uh, by him, uh -huh. seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. See, this is this is the type of priest we need. He is able to save us to the uttermost. So there's no, it's, it's no trouble we can get in. There's no way that he cannot save us. He's always around. It said he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Go ahead. For such an high priest became us, mm -hmm. who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. See, this is the type of high priest we need. This is why it's important to understand when it said Melchizedek didn't have begin the, uh, begin the days and end of life. That meant what it said. Didn't have mother, father, or descent. That meant what it said. That was an example of Jesus before he became a man. And he became a man made the offering that had to be offered, which was himself, and then he took up the mantle of that priesthood. Now he working for God on our behalf, but it wasn't new. He told Abraham, I'm the priest of the Most High God. He just came and made the sacrifice that needed to be made. So now it said, that's the type of priest we need. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, 27. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. 
But this he did once uh -huh. when he offered up himself. When he offered up himself. He not offering up animals. He offered up himself. 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was was since the law mm -hmm. maketh, maketh the son who was consecrated forevermore. See, the law maketh men high priests. That was Aaron and his sons. They were all sinful. But the word of the oath, the Lord made a promise in Psalm that somebody would come and be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it was, it, it's the same one that's going to be king, king over the people. But now, let's go right into the eighth chapter, eight and one. Go ahead. Now, the things which we have spoken, this is the son. Uh-huh. We have such an high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. So that's what Jesus is. He's at the right hand. He had to come. This is why all this is so important. This is why we go through all this celebrating the Passover and unleavened bread because we understand that it's a great part of the plan of God. He died and resurrected and went to the right hand of the Father and sitting there right there, right now, operating as the high priest. That's why, hey, he could pray to the Father to give us some leniency when we in trouble. We who is set on the right hand, we got such this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, uh -huh. and not man. Go ahead. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Uh-huh. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Okay, every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So keep your finger. We're going to come back to Hebrews. Let's go and see. We just saw in Hebrews 7 that he offered up himself. But let's go saw in Isaiah 53. And we read this recently since we was dealing with the Passover, but it's not going to hurt to read it again. Isaiah 53, because the story been told. People got a problem. Some Hebrews got a problem. Oh, gee, we don't need nobody to die for our sins. You gonna, everybody going to die for their own sins. Well, you're right mm -hmm. if you don't accept the one that died for you. But, but the Lord had a plan from day one. 53 and 6. Go ahead. All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh -huh. We have turned every one to his own way. Go ahead. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, he put it on somebody. He had to have a priest to make an offering. And he put the sins on this offering. Go ahead. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Mm -hmm. Yet he opened not his mouth. Uh -huh. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep. Before his shearers, he is dumb, mm -hmm. so he opened not his mouth. See, that's why Jesus knew when the Passover was coming. He said, two days, I'm going to be betrayed, and they're going to kill me. And then those high, those high priests, those leaders during Jesus' day, they was plotting to try to figure out how to kill him. But when they arrested him, he didn't even try to defend himself. Go ahead, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Mm -hmm. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Mm -hmm. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. For the transgression of my people was he beat down. Was he stricken? Go ahead. And he made his grave with the wicked. He, two thieves died with him. Go ahead. And with the rich in his death. Uh-huh. Because he had done no violence. Nothing wrong. Go ahead. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. But what? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Mm -hmm. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, mm -hmm. and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It said he shall, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. See, this is foretold before Jesus came and did it. He offered up himself, not a bull or a goat like the traditional priest, for sins. Go ahead. He shall see of the travail of his soul uh -huh. and shall be satisfied. Go ahead. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. See, he going to justify many. And what else? For he shall bear their iniquities. And he bear their iniquities. See, this is what a priest is. No, it's job is to do to help the people get right with God. But go ahead. 
Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, uh -huh. and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, mm -hmm. because he hath poured out his soul unto death, Go ahead. and he was numbered with the transgressors. Numbered with the transgressors. Go ahead. He bare the sin of many. And he bare the sin of many. Go ahead. And made intercession for the transgressors. See, way before he came and did it, it was foretold. That's how you know it's true. But now go back to uh, Hebrews uh, 9 this time. Because it just said... He was numbered with transgressors. He bare the sin of many, it said, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's see who did that again. Hebrews 9 and verse 28. This is what Jesus had to come to do to prove himself a priest and become the priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's not no lightweight job that you're going to offer yourself up. That's not a lightweight job. He didn't take that lightly. That's why when he started thinking about it, he didn't want to do it. He submitted to the Father's will. 9 and verse 28. Go ahead. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. That's what it just said in Isaiah 53. He bare the sins of many. Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many. Go ahead. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. But you got to be looking for him. You got to be doing his will. And when he come back, you, your sins will be clean and you will get salvation. Why? Because you trusted in that priest after the order of Melchizedek, that one that met Abraham. You trusted in him. The one that said, drink the bread in remembrance of my body, which is broken and drink the wine, which is about my blood. See, all that was foretold long before it happened. Now, let's go to uh, back up a little bit to verse 11. And go ahead. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Go ahead. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See, by, not by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, by his own blood he did it. And he obtained eternal redemption for us. Go ahead. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purification, purifying of the flesh. See, now, if, if, it, if it worked when Levi killed all the animals, that kept them straight for a temporary time being. That was a temporary fix, like putting a Band-Aid on the problem. But it was really what it constituted, what it pointed to. But if that worked, if the blood of bulls and goats and ass of a heifer spring and unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, that made you clean for that time. What you think about Jesus, verse 14? How much more shall the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, mm -hmm. purge your conscience from dead works mm -hmm. to, to serve the living God? Oh, how much more shall the blood of Christ just save you by grace and you don't have to do nothing? Mm -hmm. That's not what he said, is it? No. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's what always come with it. That's why we doing all this. That's why we dealt with last night. After the feast, the real work begins. We got to serve the Lord now that we come to the Passover land. Let's go further. Uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Right into the 10th chapter. Because he gives you all kind of examples on this. 10 and 1. Go ahead. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. See, it lets you know it was different aspects of the law, too. People, when they think of law, they just think of the Ten Commandments and other laws, and they want to get rid of all of those. No, it was different aspects. They had animal sacrifices that was a part of the plan of God as well, but it was showing you about the offering that Jesus was going to make and how he was going to become the high priest. So he said, the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things connected with those sacrifices. So we talk about the sacrifice that they made according to the law. Connect with those sacrifices, which they offer year by year, continually make the commas down to perfect. So what he's saying is, brothers and sisters, that that was a shadow, but if it was, if the killing of bulls and goats was getting the people straight in the old days, 
why did they have to keep killing the bulls and the goats? Mm. That's the real point. Mm. Why we got to keep doing Why we got to do it? Well, I did that last year. Mm. Again? <laughs> I thought I was, because you wasn't getting straight. It was just a shadow of what was going to get you straight. You wasn't getting fixed. It was just pointing to what's going to get you fixed. So it's like going through the motions of something to teach you that, yeah, this is a ritual you go through because it's pointing to something better. That's what he said. He said, go ahead, verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be off. That's right. They, you would have been straight last year. You wouldn't have to do it again. You wouldn't have to do it again the next year. They would have ceased to be offered if you got straight when you did it the first time. Mm -hmm. See, that's why we're not studying offering up no Passover lamb. We recognizing the one offering that the pat that Jesus made for us on the Passover. Go ahead. Because that the worshiper once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Uh huh. Go ahead. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So you got reminded every year. Go ahead. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. See, it wasn't getting you from under sins, but it was a shadow of what was going to get you from under sins. See, that's why that's the greatness of the priesthood after Melchizedek when Jesus came off of himself. Versus the Levitical priesthood. That was just a shadow. That wasn't the real thing. That's why he didn't come out to the order of Levi. Skip over to verse 10. Go ahead. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Oh, we are saint by the which will we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But that's exactly what it said in Isaiah 53. He said he had put him to grief. And he had made his soul an offering for sin. Because body and soul is one and the same. We are souls. We are all souls. So if something happened to our body, something has happened to our soul. By which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Keep your finger in Hebrews. We're going to come back again. Go to Joel 2. I like to show things from old and the new. And especially because a lot of people that say they believe in the old and don't believe in the new, they think that, uh, you know, it was, you, you never see more than one back there. You just all, it was just, you know, the father. They think that was the father, even though they call him Yah or Jah. Hey, that was the son before he became the son. That was him. But they, but if you pay attention, you will see both of them together, just like what we started off with, with Melchizedek meeting Abraham, and he come out of nowhere and said, look, I'm representing the Most High God. I'm going to bless you from the Most High God. I'm the priest of the Most High God, and by the way, I'm a king too. So you need to recognize me. Who is... Greater than Abraham that Abraham need to recognize unless you really talking about the most high God. Joel 2 and verse 1. Joel 2 and verse 1. See, you're going to see that it's always been a go-between between the father and us, man. Joel 2 and verse 1. Go ahead. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion uh -huh. and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Now he said... Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. That's how this world go in. The trumpet's going to be blowing. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Go ahead. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble uh -huh. for the day of the Lord coming. Uh -huh. For it is nigh at hand. See, it's coming too. It's getting closer and closer. Eventually, this thing going to be over with. Go ahead. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. Go ahead. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. Mm -hmm. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. See, so he even going to have the, the eastern block come across there and fight against the west, and that's how the world going to end. The Lord going to have to intervene. So he really, he really referring to them. But this is pointing us down to the end of time. And it's, we got some hard times coming that we're going to have to be girded up and prepared to deal with, even with great tribulation and all that's come with that. So, but skip down, but, but knowing, again, we got somebody on our side. We got a high priest at the right hand of God working for us. Hey, we can, 
be prepared and deal with what we got to deal with. We got somebody on working on our behalf. So skip to verse 10 and go ahead, though. The earth shall quake before them. Uh-huh. The heavens shall tremble. Mm-hmm. The sun and the moon shall be dark. Go ahead. The stars shall withdraw their shining. See, we now we at the end of the world for sure. He said the earth going to quake before them. Really, it's talking about the Lord when he bring Russia through there. But the earth going to quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon going to be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. This is going to be a terrible day. If you don't know the Passover lamb then, you better figure it out quick. Mm. Go ahead. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Uh Uh-huh. For his camp is very great. Go ahead. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Uh Uh-huh. And who can abide it? Who can abide it? It's going to be a terrible day. And it's coming soon. Verse 12, though. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Oh, since it's gonna be such a terrible devastation, so much devastation going on, those that know the Lord really need to turn to the Lord and be seeking the Lord. Need to do that now, but especially at this time. But notice somebody, it's the Lord, is saying, Turn to me, right? He said, Turn to me. He said, Verse uh, 12, therefore also now. Said the Lord, turn ye uh, even to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. What else? Verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments. See, don't go through the outward show. The Lord don't care about the outward show. Brothers, I'll talk nine. Brothers be talking about fringes, fringes, fringes. Look, put the fringe in your mind. Mm. He said, rend your heart and not your garments. Go ahead. And turn unto the Lord your God. And turn unto the Lord your God. Go ahead. For he is gracious. For he is gracious and merciful. What else? Slow to anger. Slow to anger. Uh Uh-huh. And great of kindness. Uh Uh-huh. And repenteth him of the evil. Go ahead. For who knoweth if he will return and repent. Uh Uh-huh. And leave a blessing behind him. Uh Uh-huh. Even a meat offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Oh, see, most Old Testament Hebrews, hey, they don't know nothing about this. They don't know that you got both of them right here. You got the father and you got his priest in this verse right here. Because the one talking all the time. It's like Melchizedek came talking to Abraham and said, look, I'm priest of the most high God. Blessed be you of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And Abraham recognized, Abraham, hey, paid him tithe. But he didn't pay tithes to the most high God. He didn't pay tithes to the father, did he? He paid tithes to the one came representing the father, didn't he? To Melchizedek. That's who Abraham paid the tithes to. Now, this same guy's talking right here. He talking all along. Notice at verse uh, 13, well, even at, at 12, he said, therefore now said the Lord, turn ye even to me. See, this is Melchizedek talking right here, said turn to me. This is not the father. This is the one we know as Melchizedek talking. He said, turn to me, right? That's what he said. Turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. And then he said, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and a great kind. So it's it's still, it's referring to the Lord now. Mm -hmm. And he, and repenting him of the evil. And then verse 14 said, who knoweth if, if he will return? It's referring to the Lord. It's referring to that one. Who knoweth if, if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him and a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? So it's talking about the Lord your God, and it said, turn to him, and who knoweth if, if he going to leave a meat offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God? So you got the priest right here. That's making an offering for you. But now let's go further. Go to um, Hebrews 5. Back to the New Testament. Hebrews 5. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Hebrews 5 and 1. Okay, go ahead. 
For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God. Uh-huh. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. See, and that's what he was just telling us in Joel. But that high priest wasn't taken from among men. That high priest is the one that came after the order of Melchizedek. That was Jesus back then. But go ahead. Who can have compassion on the ignorant mm -hmm. and on them that are out of the way. Uh -huh. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. See, that's the normal high priest. Go ahead. And by reason hereof he ought ask for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. That's right. Go ahead. And no man taketh his honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Right. Aaron didn't make himself a high priest. The Lord called Aaron to be the high priest, Moses' brother. And made him the high priest. Go ahead. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest. So same thing to Christ. Go ahead. But he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Oh, so the father had made this this way. He said, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And this is written in Psalm, the second chapter. Go ahead. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, he said in another prayer, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But again, the question uh, keep got to come up, how is he going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? If both of them live forever, then we got both of them sitting there being a the priest forever. Unless that's just a prototype before he came. That was just Jesus before he became a man. Just like Jesus was ruling over Israel before he, be, before he turned it over to men. See, he was the priest, and then he let Levi handle the priesthood for a while. He was the king, and then he gave the kingship over to Saul for a little while. That's the way the Lord been doing. The Lord said, I've always been running this from day one. I just let you all give you an example of my rulership and my priesthood. That's what he's been doing. So he said, verse 6, as he said also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 1 Timothy 2. Let's, let's, let's look at what I've been saying. 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. And we will pick it up at verse uh, 5. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. Okay, go ahead, my brother. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, so it's one God. That's all. That's In this case, it's referring to the Father. We know it's more than one in the Godhead because that's why it's even bringing in Jesus right now. But there's one God. Then he turned around and said, right away, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's one mediator. So where is Melchizedek? That's Christ Jesus. It's always been one. See, it was one when he met Abraham. It was one when he met Abraham. He said, I am the priest of the Most High God. And when he became a man, he came to prove that, to do the act to make him the priest. And he did that on what we just celebrated, the Passover day. He became, he made the offering to substantiate his priesthood as coming through man now. Because he had became a man and made that offering, died, he resurrected. Now, that's why I say after the order of Melchizedek, because he came a man to take it back up. It's basically like you're giving something up and then you get it back. Just like the Bible said in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Then it said the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He gave up being God. He gave up. Being Melchizedek for a time. Just like he gave up being the king over Israel after he brought him out of Egypt. And they kept begging him for a king. He said, okay, I'm going to give you one. So it's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's it. It's not two. So we're not going to have Jesus here and Melchizedek here fighting over who's going to do it. I do it this time. Mm -hmm. No, I do it. It's my turn. 
Uh uh-uh. uh. It's only one. Go ahead. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that's how he did it. He, he, he gave himself a ransom. Offered himself up. Didn't have to even let them people kill him. That's show you that's some faith in God. You ain't got many men to do that, get their life up, and you ain't got to. You know, I, I changed my mind. Go ahead. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher mm-hmm. and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Okay, that's good. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 10 now. 1 Corinthians 10. See, in the way you can clearly identify that it's none other than Jesus, again, we dealing with multiple facets or we dealing with multiple hats. We dealing with somebody, we not just dealing with a priest. We dealing with a king priest. So that's not something you see every day. Jesus, the king priest Melchizedek. 1 Corinthians 10. But the key is understanding that Jesus was around from day one. So you won't be surprised to see him walk up on Abraham as the king and priest of the most high God. Because he was, you know, he was there. He wasn't asleep. First Corinthians 10 and 1. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Uh-huh. And were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. See, we just got through dealing with all of this when Israel came out of Egypt, delivered on the Passover. Pharaoh lost all, Pharaoh and the Egyptians lost somebody in their house on the Passover. Somebody was dead. Israel got delivered, ate unleavened bread, walked out of Egypt. Pharaoh started chasing them. He drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Israel had a new beginning with the Lord thing. Mm-hmm. But what he, he, so he rehearsing that, he said, our fathers were under the cloud and went through that Red, talking about the Red Sea, through the sea, and verse two. And were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh-huh. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Go ahead. And did all drink the same spiritual rock. Uh, uh-huh. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. See, it let you know that was Christ back then, leading them, leading them through the Red Sea, guiding them in a the cloud by day and a fire by night. That was Christ. He fed them with spiritual meat and drink, gave them instructions to follow. And it said, and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. What are you doing talking about Christ at the Red Sea? Because he always been around. Like it's saying Micah, the, the, uh, the fifth chapter, that he was going to be born in Bethlehem to be king over Israel. That's another king scripture. To be king over Israel. But it says, going forth, so I've been from old, from everlasting. That's why when Melchizedek show up, that's nothing new. That's why I say he don't have begin the days and the life. Now, let's go back there. Let's go to 1 Samuel 8. 1 Samuel 8. And show you, just like he allowed Levi to become priest as a prototype, an example of God's real priesthood, he let, some, he let somebody become king as an example of the real king. But ultimately, Melchizedek was the king and the priest already, wasn't he? That's what he said. That's what happened when he met Abraham. He didn't meet Abraham as just a priest. He met Abraham as king of Salem. It even described that as king of righteousness and king of peace. Can't too many people wear those titles. And priest of the most high God. So he wearing multiple hats. First Samuel 8 and 1. Go ahead. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Mm -hmm. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, Mm -hmm. and the name of his second, Abiah. Uh They were judges in Beersheba. Go ahead. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre Mm -hmm. and took bribes and perverted judgment. See, now this go to show you that it don't matter what you do, how good you are, your children get to choose whether they want to serve God or not. There was no prophet. Samuel was one of the greatest prophets ever existed. 
His mother prayed for him, and the Lord blessed her to have Samuel, and she dedicated him to the Lord. So from a child, he was like prepared to serve God. She took him off and dropped, just dropped him off at the priest. Yeah, he yours. And he was dedicated to the Lord from a child. I'm talking about this man prayed and said, look, right now I'm going to show you how bogus you are. I'm going to pray to the Lord. It's not harvest time, whatever. And he started praying. He said, it's going to start thunder and lightning in a minute. Boom! And people was like, whoa. So, but with all this greatness that Samuel had, his sons were bogus. His sons didn't do, didn't follow in his footsteps. They was bogus. That show you all, all of us get to choose. You could choose to be right. Your child don't have to. Your child get the right to choose like you choose. That's between. That's going to be between them and the Lord. And the Lord going to handle it, but it just let us know. Because sometimes we assume automatically, you know, that, oh, my, my kid's going to be okay. I told him the right thing. Yeah, that's good. But now it's between them and the Lord. So what he said, he said uh, when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel too. So they was in leadership. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abiah. They were judged in Bathsheba. And his sons walked not in his ways. See, they had their father as an example, but they could do what they want to do. It's up to them. They should have followed their father's footsteps because they're going to have to answer to the Lord for that. And he said they were judged in Bathsheba. And what did they do? Read three again. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Oh, they was bogus. They took bribes and perverted judgment. That means they was about their own thing. Go ahead. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and Ramah uh -huh. and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Go ahead. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. See, now they 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 use Sam, uh, Samuel's sons as an excuse, but they still was wrong. It ain't like the Lord, this ain't nothing that, that the Lord can't handle with Samuel's sons. So, but now they want to do something else. They really looking at the other people. See, we all the other people got them a king, Samuel. We want us a king. So that's what they come to Samuel with their request. Make us a king. But this is good because the title of the lesson is Jesus, the king priest, Melchizedek. See, somebody already was the king. Melchizedek was a king, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he was representing the most high God. See, so, hey, Abraham represent, rep, uh, recognized who Melchizedek was. But see, these people didn't forget. So they wanted a physical king, in other words, that they could see. See, yeah, Melchizedek, he wasn't around all the time, but he was the one running it as king and priest. But go ahead. Verse 6. Mm -hmm. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Uh-huh. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. See, it displeased Samuel. And he was right to be displeased in a sense. I mean, they, they were wrong for requesting this. Because how you, why are you worried about having a king when the Lord then killed Pharaoh, Pharaoh's army, got you out of slavery, gave you a promised land you didn't know nothing about, land of milk and honey, what you need? Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Samuel, mm -hmm. hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. Go ahead. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Oh, now the Lord said, go ahead and do it, Samuel. The Lord said, go ahead and do it, because Samuel was called, he was known as a judge. See, that's what the Lord was using. He would use some, he used to rise up some men, and he called them judges and, and put them over the people. But ultimately, he was the king. That's how the Lord was doing it. So the Lord didn't like this. See, that's so you, you ask the Lord for something. The Lord won't like it. He'll give it to you anyway. Because, okay, that's what you want. I'm going to give it to you, but in the end, it's going to be to your detriment. So verse 7, it said, The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee. The Lord even told Samuel, Look, they ain't rejected you. But they have rejected me 
that I should not reign over them. So the Lord was reigning over them, wasn't he? He was the king. And that's none other than Melchizedek. See, again, Melchizedek didn't just show up. It wasn't like when he came to Abraham, he show up. Look, this was Jesus before he became a man. It ain't like he show up and then went back somewhere and went under a rock and went to sleep. He the one handling all of this. That's why he showed up as king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. That was the Lord. That's why we read in Joel, he said, who know if, if he will leave a meat offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Turn to this guy because he'll leave an offering to the Lord your God. But now, he said, they rejected me that I should not reign over them. We have verse 8. Go ahead. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, uh -huh. even unto this day, Go ahead. wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. So now he telling Samuel, he said, man, you, feel, you feeling kind of salty, but I'm the one should really be feeling salty. <laughs> he said, they ain't rejected you. They rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to like they have been doing me since I brought, brought them up out of Egypt. He said, according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. He said, Sam, you just getting a little taste of what I've been dealing with. Join the club. Give them a king. Go ahead, verse 9. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that, they reign, that shall reign over them. See, and, and this is how the Lord will do it too. The Lord will give you what you want, but he'll, he'll warn you in advance. Look, this is going to be a problem in the end. But hey, go ahead. This is what you want. I'm going to give it to you. He said, protest solemnly unto them. But give them what they want. Skip over to the 12th chapter now. 1 Samuel 12 and 1. 1 Samuel 12 and 1. Go ahead. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice and all that ye said unto me and have made a king over you. Now he made Saul king. The Lord picked him still. The Lord pointed out who the king was going to be because the Lord's still running things. But he gave him Saul as their king. That's what they wanted. They got Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the first king of Israel. Gave him Saul. So Samuel said in all Israel, I've hearkened unto your voice and all that you said unto me, and I made a king over you. So now Melchizedek, the king of Salem, is letting somebody else be king over his administration, over his people. Just like they got Levites that were priests. He allowed the Levites to be priests. Go ahead. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. Mm -hmm. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. See, that's what Samuel telling them. But skip to save a little time. Skip to, uh, matter of fact, let's keep reading. Go ahead, verse 3. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, mm -hmm. and I will restore it you. See, when you serve in the Lord, you ain't trying to get nothing from people. That's why people come here, we ain't asking you for nothing. We don't even care what you got. We trying to give you something. And... You can't, can't nobody accuse you of saying, well, they, you know, they was trying to get this out of me. It was asking me about all my, like, you know, like some preachers want to know your tax information and everything. You, you, you know, I ain't lying. Some preachers, you got to bring your tax returns so they can see what's going on. So, but when you serve in the Lord, you ain't thinking about none of that stuff. So Samuel, he said, look, because Samuel felt a little salty because now they're going to say, you know, give us somebody else. Give us a king. And he said, look, I did what y'all said. But by the way, point out if you say I done done something wrong, I done done something to any, any of you. you like, like some people, sometimes people get mad. And they say, oh, I ain't going to that church no more. And they done left. That's fine. You do what you want to do. But don't act like somebody here did something to you. Nobody did nothing to you. 
Nobody took nothing from you. Only thing somebody did is try to help. You. So this is really what Samuel laying out. He said, look, now bring it up here. What have I done? Somebody come up here and be a witness and show what I took, how I defrauded you, how I misused this person over here. I did this person wrong. Show it to me. If I received any bribe to blind mine eyes, wherewith I have, wherewith, and I will restore. Verse 4. And they said, thou hast defrauded us, nor not defrauded us, uh -huh. nor oppressed us. Go ahead. Neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. Go ahead. And he said unto them, the Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. Okay, because now he done made Saul king. Go ahead, 6. And Samuel said unto the people, it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Uh -huh. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. Now, he, he so he taking them back now. He said, I really want to let you know, look, you, you, you looking for a man to do something, but it's the Lord been doing this all the time. It's the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers out of Egypt. And now, stand still. I'm going to show you something about the righteous acts of the Lord. Verse 8. When Jacob was coming to Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, <clears throat> then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when he forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, mm -hmm. and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Mm -hmm. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Baalim and Ashtaroth. Mm -hmm. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. Mm -hmm. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedan, and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwell safe. See, and that's what the, that's how the Lord had been doing. So he just going back. So look, the Lord been handling this thing. You you really didn't need a king, but you got one now. But the Lord been dealing with it. He brought Moses. He used Moses and Aaron. And even when you got in trouble, the Lord has sent somebody like He sent Jephthah, even include Himself. He said in Samuel, and delivered you, and you were safe. Verse twelve. And when he saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against See, that's, that's what happened, too. They kind of got a little scared when this guy Nahash came up on them. So he said, when you saw Nahash, the king of Ammon, came against you, what happened? You said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Oh, a king shall reign over us when who was your king? The Lord your God. And the only Lord God we didn't know, we ain't known the Father. The only one we known is the same one Melchizedek. I mean, Abraham met Melchizedek, the one we that became the Son. That's the only one we've known. You ain't known the Father, but He was your King, and that's what He said when He met Abraham. That's what was told. He was king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. We seen how he came as a man, brought the bread and wine on the Passover, died, offered himself, and when he resurrected, he became the high priest. But now he let the king go right here, but he still got to become king. He still got to become king again. See, Jesus is not king right now, but he came and did all the preliminary to be king to take up this kingship. But he had let it go here. He said, when the Lord your God was your king. Go ahead, verse 13. Now therefore behold, the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. The Lord did it. He set a king over you. Go ahead. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord See, your God. And it's still hope in this if you do the right thing. Go ahead, 15. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord. On the other side, go ahead. But rebel against the commandment of the Lord, mm -hmm. then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your father. Uh-huh. Let's read a little further. This is what I was talking about earlier, 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Mm -hmm. Is it not wheat harvest today? Mm -hmm. I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, mm -hmm. which ye have done in the sight of the king and asking you a king, in the With, sight of the Lord and mm -hmm. asking you a king. See, the Lord didn't like that. 
He said, this is evil that you'd have done in the sight of the Lord because he was the king in asking for him to make you a king. Verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. Uh -huh. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Uh -huh. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, uh -huh. that we die not. For we have added unto us all our sins this evil to ask us a king. See, and they told Samuel, they said, Pray for us, because now they, they understood they had messed up. But now, let's go to Hosea. Hosea, the 13th chapter. Hosea, the 13th chapter. And we're going to pick it up at verse 9. And we're going to wrap it up now. Hosea 13 and 9. Hosea 13, right after Daniel. Hosea 13. And start at verse 9. Go ahead, my brother. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, mm -hmm. but in me is thine help. See, this whole story is about... Start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was Israel. This whole Bible is about that. From beginning to end, he said, Oh, Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but what? In me is thine help. But in me is your help. This is the Lord talking still. We done messed up. And what did he say here? Verse 10. I will be thy king. Notice he said, I'm going to be your king. See, he did not like the fact that they're going to have the audacity to ask for another king. He said, I'm going to be your king. Go ahead. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy city? Uh-huh. And thy judges of whom thou saidest, give me a king and princess. See, he said, where is anybody else that can save you? Hey, we can't see them now, do we? Mm -mm. We need some help now for sure. And the only one going to save us is the Lord our God, that, that Melchizedek. That's the only one that's going to be able to save us. That's why brothers out thumbing their fingers at the Gentiles. I say, brothers ain't got good sense at all. Mm. They out on the corner. Like, you going to do this? Look, you ain't doing nothing now. Y'all going to bow down to it. Look, I would be quiet until it's time for you to do something. And you ain't going to do nothing until Melchizedek show up. So why are you out shaking your fist on the corner and they come and knock it off whenever they get ready? See, they shooting people all the time. So he said, look, I will be your king. Where is any other that may save thee in all your cities and thy judges of whom thou saidest, give me a king in prison? Where's the one? You asked me for a king. I remember that. I haven't forgot. Where they at now? Look at, basically, the Lord said, look at yourself now. Look at yourself. Go ahead, verse 11. I gave thee a king in mine anger mm -hmm. and took him away in my wrath. See, I gave you a king in mine anger, the Lord said. We, this going back to what we just read in Samuel. That's when he gave us a king. He said, I gave you a king. I was mad. I gave you a king in mine anger and I took him away in my wrath. Because we got bogus and he warned. Samuel warned him, if you don't do right, you and your king going to get messed up. And that's exactly what happened. But the Lord said he's going to be our king. Because he had it, he was always the king. He just let somebody else do it. Just like he let the Levites be priests. Let's go to John 18. John 18 now. So the same time when he came to offer himself at the Passover lamb, this was a prevalent question about whether he was a king or not. No coincidence. John 18. John 18. And we're going to pick it up at verse 33. So, Jesus clearly knew that he had to play the part of a priest by offering himself and he was a king. And he's going to let you know right here. 18 and 33. Go ahead. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again mm -hmm. and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? See, now he, he got Jesus. They got Jesus arrested. This is the Passover night. This is the Passover night. Or really the, the next day now. It's the next day they got Jesus arrested. This is the night after he had uh, gave the disciples the bread and the wine. 
Now Pilate got him, and he's in the judgment hall. And the question is, art thou the king of the Jews? Nobody don't pay attention to that this was the main accusation floored at him. Go ahead. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Uh-huh, go ahead. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? See, who did it? The religious leaders. They delivered him. But he had to be delivered, and he allowed it because he know he's the Passover lamb. And he and to be a priest, he got to offer. He got to make this offering. He had to make this offering himself. That's show you, boy, God got to had an awesome plan from day one. He gonna make his offering by letting them kill him. Mm. First, he had to live righteous and be perfect, though. But go ahead, verse uh, thirty six. Six. Uh huh. Jesus answered, "My kingdom is not of this world. Mm -mm. If my kingdom were of this world." Then would my servants fight mm -hmm. that I should not be delivered to the Jews? Mm -hmm. But now is my kingdom not from hence. See, now Jesus let him know. He said, look, if it was time, we'd be fighting, which lets you know when it is time, what's going to happen? Because his kingdom got to come. He said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He, he really let Pilate off the, off the hook. He said, look, Pilate, you ain't got to worry about it. If it was time for my kingdom, it wouldn't go down like this. But he had to be the priest first. He had to offer himself, which, which means he had to die, which means he couldn't be king. So he said, if it was time for my kingdom, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Pilate going to take one more shot at it. Pilate said, okay, so what you telling me then that you you a king? Pilate trying to figure this out. And Jesus finally going to answer him. Go ahead. Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. Mm -hmm. To this end was I born. Oh, to this end was I born. He was born to be king. But he was subservient right here to Pilate. Pilate was a a real king ruling at this time, and he had Jesus in handcuffs, basically. So he was subservient to Pilate at this time, but that was only by design because he's being a priest right now. So, but my point is, Jesus still haven't became king yet officially. Mm -hmm. He was subservient, but he told him, he said, yeah, I was born to be king. Go ahead. And for this cause came I into the world, uh -huh. that I should bear witness unto the truth. Mm -hmm. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. See, he said, I was born to be king, and this is why I came in the world, to bear witness to the truth. See, he didn't come to be king right then, that day. Right now, he about to make his offering. And when he came out the grave, he's high priest. And when he come back, now he just warned, he just warned Pilate. He said, if it was time for my kingdom, we would fight. Let's go to uh, Timothy. 6, 1 Timothy 6, and show you that when the time get here, what's going to happen? Because he got to do it all. 1 Timothy 6, and we're going to pick it up at 13. And that's what I like. The Bible just keep interpreting itself. Paul is actually going, as we like to say, piggyback on what Jesus was just telling Pilate. He going to piggyback on that. 1 Timothy 6 and 13. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 13. Okay, go ahead. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, whom before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Now, we just saw Jesus talking to Pontius Pilate. So he's telling you the same thing. He said, I give you a charge before the Father, before God, who quickened all things. And the charges before Christ Jesus, who, by the way, before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. He confessed. What did he confess? He confessed that he was born to be king. It just wasn't time. Mm -hmm. If it was time, we would be fighting, Pilate. But don't worry. You got a break right now. That's really what he was letting them know. He said, well, yeah, I was born to be king. I come to bear witness of that fact. I am king. But. That's exactly what he said in Hosea. I will be your king. You ain't got nobody else that can save you. See, Jesus on a straight mission to save Israel as a priest and a king, and many <laughs> brothers rejecting him. And he on a straight mission to do it. 
So he said, Pilate, uh, Jesus witnessed a good confession before a Pilate, Pontius Pilate, verse 14. But the charge to us is what? 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to come back and make a second coming, a second appearing, and we got to be obedient until then. That's the work we got to do. And But when he come, what he going to do? 15. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. Oh, when Jesus come back in his times, he going to show. He told Pilate we would be fighting, and this is what he going to do. He going to show who is the blessed and only potentate. Potentate mean the one that wields the power. The one that got the power. See, he going to have to show the world that he is indeed that same king that met Abraham. He wasn't playing when he said he's king of Salem. He said, which in his times he going to show who is the blessed and only potentate the what? The king of kings and lord of lords. The king of kings and lord of lords. See, he was under Pilate then. That's why he allowed Pilate. Pilate had him in handcuffs. Pilate this is the one had him killed. He didn't want to, but Pilate is the one who authorized him to die. So he was under Pilate to that degree. But that's only because he was being a priest. But when he come back, he going to show who is the blessing. Only poor and take the king of kings and Lord of lords. Let's go to Revelation 9, 17 and show you that. This is when he come back now. See, people say they believe in Jesus, but they don't, they don't even know about Jesus. You can't believe in somebody you don't even know nothing about them. 17 and 12. Revelation 17. How he going to show he's the blessing only poor and take king of kings and lord of lords? He going to fight like he told Pilate. And, and these kings is existing nowadays. They going to try to fight him. 17 and 12. Go ahead. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Mm -hmm. which Go ahead. Which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. That's right. Go ahead. These have one mind and shall give their power. And strength unto the beast. Now the key is what? Verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb. They're going to make war with the lamb. Notice he's the lamb. He's the Passover lamb that offered himself. That's what made him become the priest. So, But the same one, that's the lamb. That's the same one, that's the lion, or that is the king. So that's why I say they're going to make war with the lamb, didn't it? Nobody tell us this, and this is clearly written in our Bible, that this is what Jesus, this is what's happening when he come back. He's not rapturing us to heaven in a secret deal. Mm -hmm. He's coming back to show that he is indeed the king and priest, Belchizedek. All the way back from Genesis, he is that guy. So I said, these shall make war with the lamb. Go ahead. And the lamb shall overcome and them. And the lamb shall overcome them, quite naturally. Go ahead. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. He's Lord of lords. See, now you know what Paul meant when he said, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only poor and take king of kings. But he doing everything. He, so when you talk about Jesus dying for your sins, you can't stop there and think that that's all it's about and now we just going to float around in heaven. No, the same one that died is the same one that's a king and going to come back and rule over this earth forever. As king of kings and lord of lords. That's why he met Abraham as priest of the most high God and as king of Salem. So that's what it said. These shall make war of the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is lord of lords and king of kings and... And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Oh, that's where we want to be. I want to be with him. Let's go to Psalm 110. Oh, that's right. Psalm 110. They that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. The saints going to meet him in there, but he coming to rule this earth. See, what this was said, this was prophesied long ago, brothers and sisters. That's how you can't miss the story of God. The Lord got this thing airtight from Genesis to Revelation. That's how I know it's true. Psalm 110 and 1. Psalm 110. See, that's why Jesus had to come 
and let them kill him first. People said, well, if he was somebody, why he let him kill him? Because that was what the scripture said. He had to offer himself as a Passover lamb, which made him become the priest, the high priest. Like he was when he met Abraham. And then he died and he resurrected and he went back to the right hand of the Father. He right now making intercession for us as the priest, but he's not going to stay there. He's waiting at the right hand to come back and do the king thing. <laughs> Y'all didn't know I had a little flow. Uh, Psalm 110 <laughs> and verse 1. Go ahead. The Lord said unto my Lord, uh -huh. sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, that's what he's doing. He's sitting at the right hand right now waiting to do the king thing. To he make his enemies his footstool. Go ahead. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Mm -hmm. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Go ahead. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Mm -hmm. And the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now he talk about all this about ruling and coming and back and making his enemies his footstool. But who is it that's doing that? Go ahead. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See the Lord have sworn to him. The one at the right hand. And will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, you got both of them in all these verses. That's why I said the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand. The Lord have sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But if he a priest after the order of Melchizedek, should we understand he's a king after that order too? That's why he came from the tribe of Judah, because he promised the king would come out of Judah. David, from David's son. You a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, verse 5. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Didn't we just read that in Revelation, that these kings going to make war against him? That's exactly what he going to do. He going to deal with kings in the day. This is all airtight throughout the Bible. The one at the right hand that became priest by dying on the Passover, he is going to strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He is not playing. Go ahead. He shall judge among the heathen. That's the nations. He's going to judge among these nations. Go ahead. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. Oh, somebody need to tell their neighbor that. Tell your neighbor that. He going to fill, say, neighbor. See, these preachers don't do... Don't never say nothing that make no sense. That's something I need to know from my neighbor if I didn't know. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. Go ahead. He shall wound the heads over many countries. That's the leaders over many countries because he's the real king. Go ahead. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. He going to drink of the brook in the way. See, he, he handled his biz that he had to handle. And as the saying go, when he come back, some heads are going to roll. In, in Habakkuk, it said he going to discover the foundation to the neck. He going to take some heads off. He not playing. Zechariah 6. And, and, and this is it. One more after this. Zechariah 6. Zechariah 6 and 12. But... Abraham met him. He showed up and blessed Abraham. And like I said, it's not every day you meet somebody that you could say is got handling multiple offices, not just a priest. He's a king and a priest. Zechariah 6, and we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Zechariah 6 and verse 12. Okay, go ahead. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. See, and this, this is Jesus. This is one of the titles of Jesus. The man whose name is the branch. See, that's why he was even called a Nazarene. He was born in Nazareth and called a Nazarene. But the man whose name is the branch. Go ahead. And he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he going to grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. And even he shall build the temple of the Lord. Uh -huh. And he shall bear the glory. Go ahead. And shall sit and rule upon his throne. Oh, now he going to build the temple of the Lord. We talking about a temple. And he going to bear the glory. And he going to sit and rule upon his throne. Go ahead. 
and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And he's going to be a priest upon his throne. See, it's not every day you got somebody that's a priest sitting on a throne. So we got somebody that's a priest and a king. A priest sit upon his throne. Go ahead. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the council of peace shall be between them both. What do you mean them both? It's only one, but it's two offices. See, in the old days, like I said, Israel had priests, they had kings. Sometimes the priests and the kings got into it. Saul killed a bunch of priests. He was the king. He got mad and killed some priests. So it wasn't no peace between them at that time. And the king always had, you know, had the edge because he was the king. Mm -hmm. So, but when you the king and the priest, there, there won't be no disputes, will it? That's what he said. He said, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. That's why you got a guy that's king and priest. Hey, you don't have no schism whatsoever. Hey, he don't have to consult with nobody else on the other side of the aisle. Hey, he ain't got to worry about, well, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Uh-uh, I'm, I'm all of it. Mm -hmm. But now, one more place, Matthew 25. Or like this, like even in this country, they got the executive branch, you know, they got the, the, the president, and then they got the Congress. Hey, and they can fight all day long about it, but hey, not with the Lord. So he going to sit as a, as a priest upon his throne, Matthew 25 and 31. This is when he come back, he going to do it. Go ahead. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. See, when he come back, then he going to sit on the throne of his glory. And we already know he is a priest when he made the offering for us on the Passover. But when he come back, this is when he going to become king and he will have the full authority that he had when he met Abraham after the slaughter of those kings as king and priest. So it said, when the Lord God shall come in the glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Go ahead. And before him shall be gathered all nations. All nations. Go ahead. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided divideth his sheep from the goats. Uh -huh. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Go ahead. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So notice what he is. He is the king. He said, Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand. That's the hand we want to be on. Like it said in uh, Revelation 17, uh, these kings going to make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. We want to be with him. We want to be on the right hand. He going to say to them on the right hand, come ye blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But this will be instituted at the second coming of Jesus. The king and priest Melchizedek. Hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. And uh, I think he got some new announcements up here. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a new one. We'll get rid of that one. So he going to have to announce. I'm going to mention just a couple of things. We had, a, we had a good feast. Everything went good. I heard the last day was good here. I had a good day on, uh, in Atlanta for the last day, celebrating with the brothers and sisters down there. And... Uh, And everywhere else, everybody, it's good now. We can look around, people feasting all over the place, all over the country. People be feasting. Even if they just be in their house with two or three people, people feasting. So the word is definitely spreading, and we could thank the Lord for that. But before he had the regular ones, I'm going to mention that uh, I mentioned Brother um, Sean. Yeah, Brother Sean last night. I mentioned that last night. His mother <coughs> passed away a few, couple of weeks ago, and they have having uh, private services. So keep Brother Sean from New York in, in your prayers. Um, I was trying to see. Uh, 
Yeah, his mother' name was uh, June Nesta Roberts, and she passed away about a week and a half ago, right when we were starting to pass over, I believe. She passed away. So keep Brother Sean in, in your prayers. And uh, also, we're going to have a, a baptism coming up in about three weeks. We're going to have a baptism. We're going to announce the date and make it official. And last but not least, after all the feasting, y'all need to do some fasting. So we're going to give you an opportunity. We're going to have our monthly fast this Thursday night at sundown. Thursday night, which is uh, May 5th, from sundown to sundown. So that's the next monthly fast. Now we had a regular announcement. Our prayers that the eyes of your understanding were enlightened by today's lesson. DVDs and CDs of all our lessons are available. Please place your order in the offering box along with your donation and pick up your DVDs, CDs up at the podium next Sabbath. Please tune in to Thy Kingdom Come television program, which airs in various locations. Please join us at our other study classes, question and answer Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. via the conference call line. Also streamed live from our website. Children's Bible class every Sabbath at 12 noon. Teen form Bible class ages 13 through 19 every other Sabbath uh, at 5 p.m. If you feel you are ready to be baptized, please sign the baptismal list at the podium and or speak with Brother Wayne. The following is the dress code for our services. All clothing should be modest in appearance. Nothing tight-fitting, overly baggy, sagging, or revealing should be worn. Men are to remove hats and all head covering, and women should wear a head covering such as a hat or scarf, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1-7. through 7. If your young child becomes noisy during the lesson, distracting other members, please remove him or her to the TV monitor area in the rear of the class. Any tithes and or free will offerings should be put in an offering envelope and placed in the offering box near the podium. Pray for our strength as we pray for you. Until next Sabbath, peace. peace. Okay, if nothing else, we're going to face the rules and we we'll close out. Our Father which art in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. In Jesus' holy name we pray. In Jesus' holy name we pray. The blessed and only potentate. The blessed and only potentate. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. And King of Kings. And King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.